Welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. I'm Pookie Knightsmith and I'm your host. Today's question is, do creativity and confidence always go hand in hand? And I'm in conversation with Lucy Six. So my name is Lucy Six and um, I am a co-founder and the director of an organisation called Lifebeat. And we use, um, we work with creativity and the power of the group and community to hopefully make very transformative interventions in, in young people's lives. And, um, you know, I'm passionate about children and young people and their development and potential and voices. And, um, and also really committed to working alongside people who work with children and young people. And I have a background in the arts, which maybe we'll talk about. Yes. So when you say um, transformative interventions, what does that mean? What kind of transformation are you hoping to achieve? Um, I think the, the overall goal is that when a young person or a group of young people come on our programmes, our only intention is that they um, are able to express themselves and become a little bit more of who they are, okay. that they kind of find their unique spark inside and that that results in them feeling able to be safely more visible, more able to express themselves, and at the same time more grounded. And um, so, and also that they have more hope in themselves, life, um, their own potential, and also their own agency okay. in making that happen for themselves. So that's what we're looking to achieve. So what kind of people do you generally work with who would get referred into your programs? all sorts we collaborate with youth organizations schools individual referrals children's social care um and so and, and actually the objective is to bring together as diverse a group of young people as possible okay. and ideally not too many people who know each other and we build community um straight off the bus so to speak and um then we all go through a very a high an intensive program together and um, hopefully everybody will have discovered a little bit more of themselves. And those partnerships with youth organisations and school partners are really important in terms of the kind of before and after. Okay. And um, yeah. So in what sense? that Because they have to hold these young people either side of the programme that you're doing or do you mean in a different way? Um, well, we often find that actually with LiveBeat, that, um, a lot of youth organisations send some youth workers with their young people because they discover themselves mm -hmm. and their the young people in a new way. Mm -hmm. And um, so it also works to kind of upskill the adults as well as at the same time kind of making this serious intervention of hope and positivity for the young people. And that's probably the best model because you know we work in a very heart-centered way actually and so that's often quite a lot more that's sometimes a bit more intensively yeah. as our partner organization so it's a great compliment and then you know in terms of embedding that back in their lives we offer an extended community all year round with reunions and meetups and youth council and and um and so it means that life beat way can yeah. also be cascaded right through on the ground, so to speak. So tell me about the Life Beat Way. I mean, what does this actually look like in practice? What happens if I turn up to your intervention? What will I be doing? Okay, so our, our sort of signature summer camp programme is um, you would arrive on a bus, say the London ones, uh, coming from London. And so it really starts before you get there. Mm -hmm. um, straight off the bus, we um, organise everyone's, you know, where they're going to sleep. And so it's, I suppose, as a priority, it, um, we prioritise their care. We make it feel like they're, they're coming to someone's home. Okay. So the, the prep we do with our staff is very much about that warm, loving welcome. Yeah. And, and that first day we do intensive community build. So mm -hmm. after a few hours really everyone will have connected, learnt each other's names, uh, will have laughed, will have actually created something together within just three hours. Wow. Uh, yeah. How do you do that? How do we do that? 
Well, we do um, lots of creative, it's very structured work. All our programs are very structured with practice after practice for a reason. Um, and how do we do that? We do that with just very skilled facilitators. Okay. Who, um, and, and we separate everybody. So we might have 50 teenagers who haven't met before. Mm -hmm. And they're all then placed in smaller groups called family groups. They're like mm -hmm. home groups. So that's like your sort of anchor group for the week. Mm -hmm. And so with just a, within just a few hours, every family group will have named themselves and also come up with a creative performance. Okay. Wow. Okay. Yeah. And oh. it is amazing. It's so quick, but we do it. We turn the temperature up in terms of risk, creative risk, very, very slowly, very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. um, we don't kind of pull, pull out volunteers. We ask for volunteers. So we would never kind of elect someone to speak or do something. We just, it's all by invitation. Um, yeah. And why, why, tell me about creative risk and why that matters and why you want to introduce that, albeit nice and slowly. Because there's something about, well, just broadly, just stripping it back more conceptually, um, you know, there's something about the arts and creativity that link something about the head and the heart and what really really matters to us yeah. what is essentially our own value and the value and things we value and that we're able to express ourselves something deep in our soul you know find a language for yeah. um, something just deep in the fabric of who we are through creative expression mm -hmm. um, in terms of creative risk stepping into newness whether that's through play or games every time we do that and we have a we're seen and heard accepted and valued and we find our place within that and we actually overcome a little challenge mm -hmm. in a way that makes us feel good um we become a little bit more visible and to ourselves and other people actually um, and we do it slowly so that there's not that awful feeling of feeling overexposed. Yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of people associate creativity with come on, perform, or, yeah. and, and, it, and they're evaluated on the, on the sort of condition of their performance. So we're not about that at all. I guess you have to facilitate quite carefully so that people don't feel that they're failing. Because I guess you could have the opposite effect, couldn't you, on their confidence if you got it wrong. Yeah. Completely. And in a room full of 50 people, we usually work with a community of about 80, 90 people. So they're 50 teenagers. So we're very high ratio adult to teen. Mm. And yes, the smallest gesture, the smallest mistakes from the front in terms of that facilitation can have a huge impact. So, you know, we put a lot into staff training to kind of be very vigilant of those, the nuance. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. just as it happens on an interpersonal level in, in a therapeutic relationship, it's, 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 things have to be facilitated with the same, same level of awareness, really, and consciousness of what's happening in the room. And how has this kind of developed? Because you've been working on this program for some time now, haven't you? And is it, you know, just tell me a little bit about how it kind of came about and why this felt important and, yeah, the evolution of it. So, um, well, to me, um, to me, you mean? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, well, how I came upon it, I, I had a background in the arts and um, I, I ended up being director of the London Contemporary Art Fair. So that was a kind of previous career where I suppose I, I became passionate about the value of culture. Mm -hmm and and the arts then i retrained i decided well actually that in itself didn't matter enough to me personally it was a real fork in the road um where i decided am i gonna ramp up my own kind of knowledge and um sort of vision for what that could look like yes and and i decided no because i decided what really mattered to me were were people and i'd had my own journey um you know, inner journey and my own exploration before that, yeah. quite, quite some time from quite young, you know, I was probably 20 
and I had a kind of awakening around that and mm -hmm. then and then I retrained as a therapist and um but there was something so I had these two sides of me and the th therapeutic stuff you know I work with families and and adults mostly um and then I had some experience with American treatment residential treatment centers that worked very experientially with the power of the group and often used creativity in that endeavor and um and then so something had to bring these things together yeah and just as life happens you know it was a it was a kind of convergence for me of of a meeting that propelled this i was sort of looking for it yeah um i was doing a bit of group supervision um at a therapy training college and one of my colleagues i i said to, it was a chance conversation i said you know what i'd really like to be doing is working with young people and this this um friend and colleague who's extremely intuitive said she'd just written a paper a therapeutic kind of paper about uh, creating safe spaces for teenagers ah, okay and yeah and she had a quaker background and anyway she said oh i've heard about this guy and he's working with this model in the states and it was called power of hope and um and anyway things rolled out and i had a chance meeting with this man and it was just so the model that they've been working with the states was so familiar to me in terms of all the things I'd done that I just I just knew it was it was extraordinary. I just knew that in my deep in my instincts, and yeah. so we set up Life Beat and and it's you know why have I seen it's just the extraordinary results. Why haven't I been able to turn away from it? It's just the most impactful thing I've ever been involved with. It's the it's truly inspirational what happens. And, you know, I had a lot of questions as a therapist, you know, camp programs or interventions, you know, what, but, and I thought, well, okay, and you take it, you take a young person out of their family system and their social system and mm. make an intervention. How is that when they go back? Yeah. You know, and then I thought also, you know, really over time and, and loads of questions, but, you know, consistently I've just seen the impact and really they, they hold on, they get something that just no one can ever take away from them ever again. That's it. And Could you give an example? Like, is there anyone that's really stuck with you that where you feel it's really impacted? Yeah, I could think of thousands of, yeah. Um, okay. Well, a, a very, you know, we've, we've, we've welcomed all kinds of people, um, young people from, you know, high achievers to, through to, say, a high achiever who might ha be ostensibly on a very successful path, but through that level of being a high achiever is also huge pressure and then experiencing kind of divorce separation in their family and the sort of hardship and um, the rupture and the trauma of that at a particular time. And then, you know, life be becoming like an extended community or family yeah. for them and just seeing that person really on their way. So I've, I've known some of these young people now for 10 years. So I see them wow. blossoming into their lives, you know, successful, happy lives and not in the world's terms, but in, ter in their terms. And I think, so it can be that, or it can be, you know, at the moment we're looking very intensely at anti-racism and our role in that as an organization. We have a high um, black, we, we have a lot of young people from the black community mm -hmm. and just, you know, hearing a lot of the challenges they face daily in terms of racism and, you know, that sense of being displaced yeah. and uh, dislocated and also all the family traumas and the traumas of exclusion or you know and just seeing them find their place you know in our community and and also the behavior changing way where, where you might see behaviors as a communication yeah. um that sort of acting out that that real fear of contact relationship and often we see the behavior go up, you know, because the trust levels are more on the table, the trust question. And, um, and then there's a midpoint in the program where you just see that behavior change and the trust 
come in and, and releasing them into a place where they can just relax and be themselves and trust that they're going to be met in that. I mean, it's extraordinary. So I can think of so many examples of, you know, someone, we, we don't have many young people with high levels of need in terms of whatever the, you know, how, whatever the label spectrum, but, you know, talking to families who might say that their son has been a couple of times and it's the only place where he's find, found his place, wow. you know, you know, I mean, I can think of someone at the moment, I don't want to in any way indicate so they might see mm -hmm. themselves, but, you know, it's just so moving when, when a family says and then they turn up to everything, everything, and, um, you know, find their place in a leadership program where, you know, they're exploring dance as a, as a way of dealing with mental health or something, just doing things they wouldn't otherwise do, you know. It's, it's all broad, it's broad. It's about learning from difference. So, you know, we like, that's the whole point. I think it's one of the few places where young people can come and everyone is on a level playing field. So what kinds of, so you mentioned dance there. I mean, what, what are the actual kind of activities that, that young people might get involved in as part of your programs? Okay, so every day, I'll tell you how we do the community build with games and end games and games and all sorts. So every day we start with a community meeting. We create a community and the young people share in the making of that community around agreements. So it's very democratic and there's a sense of young people's voices being important from the beginning. Okay. Um, so that's the backbone of the community and the, and the program. And we re revisit that every day. Mm -hmm. And we say, how are we doing as a community? We're very clear about our program goals and, and, and a central one is expanding our creativity, mm -hmm. learning from others different to ourselves, um, connecting with nature, mm -hmm. exploring our inner lives, and that's beyond all, all different, all denominations, and taking action on the things we care about. So the whole program is geared around that. And every day we do a community meeting, then we do a plenary, which is a whole group session for 90 people where we explore a theme. And that might be looking at our lives as a river and the trajectory of that story. We do it in our family groups in the big space. It might be looking at um, prejudice and discrimination and stereotypes, but we, we do it experientially and creatively through art and performance. Um, it might be um, kind of how we connect to our natural world. Yeah. So, so these big plenaries are designed with a creative component, which it also involves self-reflection and personal storytelling in the group. Um, then every day there's a choice of two, lot, two blocks of workshops and they are the staff and volunteers, it's a big volunteering program, um, deliver creative workshops. So that might be, you know, drumming, dancing, poetry writing, lyrics, on themes or not on themes. And we, again, we deepen that. It might be a discussion program, youth led. If there are returnees, we might have a series of discussions, um, sort of, you know, bushcraft, land based stuff. Um, and so they can choose those and try new things, you know. There's a whole art barn for the week, oh, which wow. is an art space that's just held and people can do lovely workshops there in all kinds of medium and media. And, and then that space is often held at free time for just hanging out in and finishing off things, listening to music. It's, it's lovely. I mean, it's so lovely. And, and do, do people have, readily engage or are they ever kind of scared by these kinds of activities? Because as an adult, like the idea, I mean, it sounds amazing on the one hand and on the other, I'm thinking, I wouldn't know how to do any of those things. I'd feel deeply uncomfortable. Do you know what I mean? It, it's a, yeah, it's conflict there. It's a really good question. And um, I think because we, the way we do things, I would say, and everything can sound a little bit arrogant or complacent, but after 12 years, I can honestly say this is true <laughs> consistently. Because we take things up, the temperature up very slowly, I would say we get buy-in within the first evening from but at least 80 percent of the young people are in well and truly in and and also the workshops break down to smaller groups 
-hmm. And they're very, you know, the facilitators are, are trained in being mostly focused on the relationships of the young people and, and the interpersonal balance. So it's, it's invitational rather than kind of, it's framed as, as a choice. And, and so no, and then that other 20% or some counts it's 10%, some counts it's 5%. As I said, you will get a group of young people that will stand on the fringe. Mm -hmm. And it happens every time. But really what they're concerned about is the risk po posed to them on a psychological and emotional level in terms of stepping into the fray and trusting and connecting with others. They're the ones that are likely to either be at risk of exclusion or have been excluded. Yeah. And they're... Yeah, there's real fear of the intimacy of that. So it's not the art activities, it's more the relational stuff that they're afraid of. Because they've been let down or what, what do you think is the barrier there? They've been let down a million times. Yeah. They've been let down with their primary caregivers, their families, their, you know, rupture in relationship, um, let down by the system, excluded from school. Um, their behavior has become a challenge, but their behavior has become their safe way of being in the world because it What's creates a job there then when you've got these young people who've been kind of let down repeatedly and they're kind of standing on the fringes and you've got this amazing program. What, what role do you play? What changes? Well, we have a team on the staff who will have a skill set and an experience of interpersonal um, work. Yeah. you know, um, with young people who, and the brief to all the staff is, look, the relationships are the most important thing here. Okay. So whether people are, you know, we know the programme works, so we encourage as much participation as possible. Yeah. And the more we can fold people in individually. So we have a strategy that says, you know, if there's a group, mm. staff get alongside that group. Okay. and do kind of youth work, form relationships, and then invite them to come and join a workshop over time. And as the group gets smaller, yeah. because it becomes, it's like a group of belonging outside of the group, which is how society is, how life is, yeah. how schools are. Yeah. And, um, you know, we see that right from dot right through, don't we? So, and so slowly, slowly through the relationships of the staff, and then the bonds that they start creating outside of that home safety group, yeah. they generally fold in. I mean, I, I've, in 12 years, and then we do something right in the middle. We do personal storytelling. You know, we are, invite the young people to tell their stories. So as they start to become more authentic, yeah. then the barriers break down because they, the, you know, really the fear comes from looking at people's outsides, doesn't it? Yeah. We don't, we don't know each other in terms of that, those veils and, mm. and, and, and every, everybody is a potential threat if you've been let down a million times. Of course. So um, I think the trust starts to build as people start to tell a little bit of their story and start to become more and more authentic. And what form does that storytelling take? Is that a literal kind of verbal thing or is that done through art or, or how, how, do you, how do you access people's stories? Well, we invite them and again, at their, at their own pace. So yeah. we might do an exercise called the river of life mm -hmm. and, um, and um, that's an art practice where they might draw, draw, draw a river if they yeah. want, to, you know, otherwise it can be a mark on a page or it, they can do it verbally. It's not, nothing's coercive. And then the invitation is, you know, our life, we have a life and this is a unique, we are unique and valuable and precious and our life is. And so um, we might share, you know, some, we take, again, we take the temperature up, a challenge we've overcome. Yeah. Or um, some things that, people that have mattered to us in our journey. Yeah. And, um, and so people draw their rivers and then they share whatever they want or feel able to. And some, some, some young people won't want to do that. But then the request is that we just, 
we we try and stay as present as we can but we've always got the backup you know of teams of people that yeah. can kind of be there and swoop in and and get alongside at different points so so that's how really it it, it the trust builds over time and and that's how we ask them to tell the stories. That's it. So, but we also do it. Your, your question about creativity, you know, every night, and, and even when they're doing their art project. So, if you're doing a sort of lyric writing, there's a little ask there to for people that have come to that workshop to express something. Okay. And um, so the confidence just starts building really, really quickly in terms of that finding a voice. And um, is it important, because you said before that you try specifically to bring people together who don't already know each other, is that because that creates a safer environment for exploring the stories? Or what, what's the motivation between bringing strangers together, essentially? I suppose when we think ourselves about how we are in different relationships, we're often, um, you know, we have different stories attached to every relationship we have. And we know ourselves in certain ways, depending on who we are with in terms of shared experience or expectations of roles and dynamics. And particularly with teenagers who are so socially cued, aren't they, to fit in and behave to, to certain norms. Um, when you get groups of friends coming, Mm. Um, also that they want to have a really good time account together yeah. in their roles so this idea of exploring and becoming exploring new sides of of self and yeah. and trying new things that can sometimes hold them back because they they want to they've already got a set of norms yeah Okay. Themselves. So it's quite freeing if they're not amongst their peers, they're, well, they're amongst new peers, essentially, they can kind of find themselves a little bit and, and be free to, to do new things. How does the transition work then when they leave you? Um, how do you help them to hold on to the things that they've learned about themselves and the skills that they've developed? Yeah, well, on the, at the end, we do quite a lot around ending. I mean, I'm sure, you know, we've, you've been involved, I'm sure, in programs. These intensive programs, every day feels like a month, doesn't it? Yes. yes. So we do quite a lot around the ending before the ending come. And they, for instance, they'll, they'll do a, a sort of home plan for themselves around mm -hmm. enhancing their well-being and um, self-care, strategies for self-care, and also what new things they've tried that they really want to take home and okay. and intentions for the steps they want to take mm -hmm. and um and then they write a letter to themselves that we then post to them in six months time oh wow what a lovely idea yeah their vision for how they how they see themselves that at that point what they want to give to themselves is yeah. a lot about self-nurture and self-love and then we have a reunion shortly afterwards and um, we bring everyone together and we revisit those intentions mm -hmm. that they left, they left the programs with. And then obviously we have the relationships with the partner organizations, which, and then there's a kind of handover into what, what my next steps might look like. And yeah, that's how. And with the kind of the, the, the sharing of stories, which seems like such a kind of crucial part of this um, journey and experience, do you think that it is, about the sharing of their own story that's the important bit or is it about hearing about other people's stories or a bit of both that's super interesting and pertinent question <laughs> um it's both okay. it's absolutely both because i think the liberating um thing for young people you know is it's very very rare in their school lives for them to experience a level of authenticity amongst their peers of people really speaking from the heart you know it doesn't generally happen in schools i mean i'll tell you about that we've been doing some training for schools around that but um and so i think just that experience of that becoming a norm amongst their own peer group mm. is so empowering because yeah. it means that socializing that that teenage um, peer kind of um, attunement is dropped to an authentic level where people mm -hmm. can be themselves. 
and talk about their vulnerabilities and their hopes and fears and dreams wow. in a way that isn't usually acceptable. No, actually. So that is really empowering and liberating and just, and then also, you know, it's extraordinary the natural empathy that is, is drawn out in, in teenage for each other, which and usually we assume that there isn't, but it's just, it's, it's totally innate and through and through in that situation. And then the, the feeling of being heard, seen, valued, not humiliated, judged, excluded, marginalized, mm. when you are authentic and say, well, I haven't got it all sorted. Yeah. Um, it's just celebrating. No. It sounds like you create an environment where teenagers are able to kind of be the very best version of themselves. And I don't mean like a perfect version, but just a real version, I guess. Um, so tell me about the training you're doing with schools then. What's the motivation there and what, do you, what are you doing and what are you hoping to achieve? Well, we, um, we do our own trainings anyway, and that's how people come to volunteer on the programmes. Uh -huh. And that's in creative facilitation, creative practices that mm -hmm. anyone can use. It's easy to upskill people that are not artists to use art space practices to achieve certain things. Mm -hmm. but we've been doing that for 12 years right alongside the programs, and that's how people come to volunteer on our programs. They come on those trainings. Yeah. But it's only maybe, you know, half the people that come on those trainings have actually come on our programs. So that's been a strand. So the school's work is was started off as kind of. Um, um, PSA, we actually work with Somerset County Council, public health team, who I know you, yeah. um, you've also had links with. And we were working on their PSHE, RSHE, then more recently, um, training programs, but very much been creativity at the heart of it, trying mm -hmm. to upskill teachers to take this creative approach. And then also they develop this wellbeing framework around the three pillars, you know, belonging, relationships, healthy lifestyles. And we've done trainings to creative group process trainings to enliven those pillars. Okay. So that the teachers can take away with lots of, can take away art space, creative practices to explore different themes and to take the conversations deeper in safe ways that, okay. that aren't all about this really, um, you know, the depth of storytelling that we do in our own programs, but can at least take the conversations a bit deeper and into a more authentic place because teachers feel so, you know, felt so anxious about that. What happened? Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, that's a really hard thing that you're trying to do. I mean, I, I try and do some work in that area and it's really difficult to build that confidence actually um, in, in people to have those conversations. And I think it's much easier coming in from the outside often to, to create that sort of space. But for someone who's working with young people every day, uh, who knows them, um, I think that's harder. How do you, so how do you, how do you do that? How do you overcome that? How do you build that confidence? Well, I think, I think the practice is very structured. Okay. You know, they include every voice. Mm -hmm. So, and they take the temperature up slowly. So they're not designed to drop people into, uh, there could be all kinds of disclosure. Yeah. So, and, and, and also I suppose the truth is, as you say, by inference, that a lot of teachers will have different levels of confidence in this. Yeah. Yeah. I think more recently, um, you know, our vision has been also the power of creativity, particularly at this time in COVID-19, to create, to put the emphasis on schools as communities, yeah. to create that sense of belonging and value where people are seen, heard and, and can express themselves. Um, and that that is so, uh, it, to facilitate that through creativity. Creativity is also a buffer. You know, you create as kind of third party, it's like mm -hmm. art therapy really, where you behold someone's expression that is not necessarily directly looking at them. So there is a buffer there, which brings about a kind of shared experience, um, which is intimate and um, authentic and safe, mm -hmm. um, um, but doesn't kind of drop the whole class into 
a very risky situation where a teacher might not have the skills or confidence to deal with that. So, so they're quite structured processes we're giving people. So are you teaching them kind of specific activities that they would facilitate and that kind of thing, or is it a little bit looser than that? Yeah, specific activities all the time. So if you're doing emotional literacy as part of PSHE, how do you play games to build up that, that, uh, that language? which works not only in terms of building up verbal language, you know, locating things in the body and that sort of emotion coaching, attunement, self-regulation, but you're also doing it in a group so that in experiential process. So you're also already building in that, um, building that confidence in terms of self-expression, working with listening and expressing. So you also, uh, you're building that interpersonal skill set as well. So I yeah. think rather than sitting at a, in a class with a page of emotions and emojis and looking at them, mm. you bring that alive through a game that's very structured. So that's the kind of thing we're doing. And, and also looking at how at the moment schools can build their communities through a creative story. Okay, tell me more. So that might be a multi arts kind of story where um, you might use drama to explore a theme of this time. You might then use, um, you have an arts based um, practice that actually means that everyone can express their, their experience through a display. Mm -hmm. um, you might do a group poem that could be performed. And so, you know, some of the processes we work with can take a group from, you know, within an hour into performing a poem that they've created wow yeah i mean i'd love to do i need to it sounds really but i've i've we do it all the time so that's um so we're, we're trying to give people the skills to do these things um and and we do them you know we ask people the teachers and the people we're working with to experience that themselves and to to see themselves go from here and within an hour to be performing a poem in a group you're expecting the, the teachers and the facilitators to, to kind of learn alongside the learners though um, and be part of that experience. Yeah, the way we train is experiential. Okay. So everything we're advocating as, as a practice, we ask people to experience themselves. Wow. Does that mean then that for the people who support and, and help to, to kind of lead and facilitate your programs, I mean, they must be giving a lot of themselves a lot of the time uh, if that's the, the kind of practice you encourage. I, I mean, how do you, you know, how do they look after themselves? And, you know, that, there's so many questions there, but yeah. yeah it's... That's a really, really good question, as it is for teachers in schools, isn't it? And um, youth workers and everyone at the coalface. I think we, we try, you know, we do rotors, we do a lot of training around boundaries and interpersonal relationship. And, um, you know, we have the teams that have more experience than others who are the go-to teams uh -huh. that maybe have a therapy background yeah. where the boundary. And then we, we try, we do rest is best slots where staff sign up to those, <laughs> you know, because we're in family groups, we have different rotored, um, tasks and 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 also just as i say to teachers when we're doing this you know if we build in well-being or sort of self-care practices for the young people the staff get to do them themselves yeah so in the program so if you have say half an, an hour geared towards just even relaxation or mindfulness or a, a stretching or a yoga practice Mm -hmm. everyone gets to do that okay okay so we try to encourage the staff to introduce well self-care well-being practice into their workshops as a way of also being able to sort of take those five minutes it might be a, a mindfulness breathing session <laughs> you know you get to do it yourself so, so it's important that the the, the staff uh, stick with the whole thing and they don't kind of dip out during those quieter moments to, to get on with admin or whatever they, they they stick with the program and and work right through it all yeah 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 they're, they're very intensive programs but we just before lockdown we did a, a residential weekend just a weekend and it was with um, a group to try and 
and it was all creative workshops and from one school so they did all know each other mm. and the I aim was to build world well-being champions for the school and by day two they led the workshops the young oh wow that's incredible so how long are your how long are your programs usually then so this was a weekend and that that was unusual how long are they typically they're usually eight days eight um, days wow yeah. they're like yeah yeah that's a long time no and what um how has your work changed uh during lockdown presumably you're not holding uh these kind of events because people can't come together i mean what what yeah what what, what form is your work taking at the moment um, well, at the moment, I would say we've done, we did a lot of online creative workshops for young people mm -hmm. for the first month. We also held our own staff team. We're a community, really, of extended facilitators all over the country. So we had three sessions a week for them, mm -hmm. just a whole sharing circles. And, um, and we've had reunions and open mics and... Um, for our community and, and they've been really wonderful online and then we've done quite a lot of training uh, for schools just little bite-sized trainings and more recently the most important thing that we're looking at as a community is um, anti-racism okay yeah because we have uh, you know learning from others different to ourselves is very much at the heart of our programs and we have a strong black community in Live Beat. And when the death of George Floyd occurred, obviously it was the arising of, of global trauma, really, in terms of that systemic racism, you know, oppression. And so that arose in our own community. So we've been doing an intensive program with, uh, with the adults to look at that, to look at systemic racism and what that means and what it's going to mean for our programs going forward. And what does it mean for your programs going forward? I think where we intend to go um, is to become an actively anti-racist organization, okay. very different to non-racist, where we will even more explicitly embed um, racism as a, as a exploring racism telling our stories about racism and doing healing work around that across lines of difference as a very fundamental and explicit strand of our programs and trainings because um yeah it's, it's just it is it just feels like that's kind of true to our our community why could we wouldn't do anything else now I think uh, with this kind of unfolding of awareness, it's woken everyone up to yeah. much deeper levels. And as white, and I'm going to just know as as a white leader, mm -hmm. you know, I've had to really, really be rigorous at looking at my part in where more subtle systemic um, issues around the taboo of racism might have come in. You know, yeah. where we've been going for unity and understanding and this kind of quite utopian ideas, really. Yeah. Um, and experiences that could at times, because I am white, perhaps some more subtle stuff has, has may have gone under the radar. Not, not overt racism. We, we're doing a thorough review on that. I mean, that's not it. It's more that as a white person, if I don't make racism and anti-racism explicit in our programs, we are complicit in systemic racism and that that's what we're exploring right now and how can we do that in loving healing and creative structured ways that are meaningful for the young people we work with the staff networks the volunteer networks and organizations and so we're looking at all of that and is racial trauma something that you've specifically looked at or will look at in future definitely yeah that's coming up in a way that I think um, is going to be central in our work, actually. Yeah. So, and in fact, one of the people I was going to suggest, maybe you have a chat with, I wanted you to um, suggest someone that you could talk to. Um, yes, definitely. Because, you know, some of the young black people we work with are experiencing overt racism daily in their lives. And, um, whether that's at school, 
um, in their experience of um, relationships and community with the police. It's their daily reality. And then some of our staff, you know, their children and the young people they've worked with outside in different places, they know that to be their daily experience. And that in itself is just creates a level of trauma and a, you know, that feeling of fear, really, of what could happen at any time. I, I found this whole whole thing really distressing, um, kind of picking it apart um, a little bit, because I think I've carried a massive level of naivety about it. Um, I was speaking yesterday with a, a friend and colleague of mine, Kadra, who works for the charity uh, So White. And when she was talking about um, kind of racial trauma and her experience of just kind of everyday racism, I just... I don't know. I think there's something about, you know, hearing about the big stuff, but then it was, it, for me, it's, it's almost that it, almost like less tangible everyday bit that I, I think I, yeah, was just completely blind to. And I'm, I, yeah. And I'm not, I don't know. You know I don't know where, where one goes with that, but I think at least beginning to understand that it's a big problem and we need to do something about it is, is a starting point, but it's, it's really hard, isn't it? Yeah. It's a massive problem and it's, centuries of problem and oppression and brutality um a kind of displaced people against their will and then this terrible um brutality and silencing and taboo collective taboo it, it's monumental and now is the time but i think every one of us can make a huge difference in in exploring exactly what you said, which is, you know, I have the luxury as someone who has white skin, not that, that race is not on the table every day, all day. And it's only because my skin is white that that's the, that's the case. Yeah. And that is just a terrifying reality that, you know, a white population in a multiracial society that has all the kind of um, the ways that we've told stories about ourselves and what we've created in the world that are fundamentally flawed, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, that's, that's I, mean, I think it actually is, a, is, and the inequality of that, I think it creates a collective trauma, actually. Yeah. It's almost like keeping the lid on it all, ultimately, is um is doing harm to all 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 of us i really do believe that <laughs> and so it's now's the time yeah and and how do you you know as a white leader who works regularly with a really kind of diverse community who wants to lead um on sort of beginning to sort of tackle some of those sort of roots of racism and and begin to work with that trauma how do you do that in a way that sort of sits comfortably because I don't know about you but I feel it, I find it hard to talk about these things because I, I'm very conscious of the fact I'm white and is it my place to you know yeah how do you how do you do that what's your kind of take on that well I think my experience lately um as I have had my own unfolding awareness has been, it's like a sledgehammer, you know, around my own sort of denial. And it's been, and I, I just have tried to put myself in the fire and, and really be accountable and, uh, and, and say, this is my own racism. Yeah. And, I, and, call, and be there in that and say, this is my commitment now that is unwavering and it's not a sort of faddish thing to be humbled and to be shown um, where I've been blind and um, created any kind of organization that mirrors that oppressive yeah. kind of system that we're part of. It's very difficult as a white leader, actually, that balance. So what I'm trying to do is step back. The, the, the community of staff are very, very active in their exploration. There's such a deep bond in our staff volunteer networks because of the programs we share and experience that you know they, the commitment has been incredible from them to um to engage in this process you know we, we meet once a week 
we'll do a session. We're all reading and dialoguing. We have a WhatsApp that is just huge, confronting, really confronting. So, um, so I've, I, and then I've also uh, committed to an, um, a month long review historically for the last 12 years where people can anonymously register their observations and that's more subtle things. Mm. It's subtle, subtle systemic racism. So we're, we're looking at things like cultural appropriation in terms of the songs we sing, okay. we're looking at um, staff that might tell their stories of travel you know inappropriately so we're looking at all kinds of things but i'm just trying to empower the voices of as many as many people as possible yeah. and to step back and and just to be right in the fire with that as an accountable myself as someone who and to to name my blindness you know and to feel some grief and certainly um you know and and to listen listen and be unwavering in being accountable and, and my own commitment to to this being now central in my life that's it and, and i i know this when i make a commitment to something as deeply as this feels that's it really because the, the taboo is so strong we'll all go back into denial so quickly so you've got to hold it right there front and center which is a bigger kind of issue for you in terms of the way that you're taking your work right now the sort of the the race issue or the kind of trying to repair the rupture of covid19 that's such a good question again <laughs> <laughs> i guess so good at these guys are so on point and 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 it's a kind of yes and we always say yes and in life beat rather than but um i think I think we're in a process uh, exploring anti-racism that is actually about to come to a pause and then we will be re redesigning and replanning our programs. We'll be at, coming out of a deep process into more being in the world with it. So I think, I think very quickly, certainly into the autumn, our, our focus is going to be on, yeah, post COVID-19, whatever that looks like, we yeah. know that it's going to be very challenging for schools. Um, I mean, they're in really extremely difficult, stressful mm. leadership challenges, huge directives coming in, you know, this little bit in the, in the guidance around well-being and mental yeah. health. Amongst, I mean, you know. mm. So if we can support you with the creative part of that, we want to put a lot of focus on that in the autumn. In terms of young, we want to get the focus back on trying to serve young people. Hopefully we can do face-to-face -face programs. Yeah. Um, I think we're going to roll out the wellbeing residential because it's a very, I think that could then cas cascade through to the schools of other young people mm -hmm. uh, with these creative practices that they can lead. Um, and then I think the anti-racism, that will become embedded in, in everything we do. So I'm just telling you, I'm just describing because we're in the process. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like a very kind of rich tapestry in that you're learning as you as you go, which I think is really important. And with the, um, you know, as, as schools kind of return to wider reopening and you, you kind of mentioned there about the, the role of, of creativity. And I think there is this tension I'm feeling at the moment where there is this understanding that creativity and play and nurture are surely going to be really important ingredients in terms of helping young people to bounce back. But then on the other hand, they've missed six months of school and there's so much catch up to do. And what's your kind of take on that? What do you think, you know, people listening who are maybe working in schools, working with young people, how should they be prioritizing what they're doing? I love that. I love your question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, because they're so they're so current. It's like it's, everything you're asking is exactly what I'm thinking about. Um, and and can, you know dialoguing about. Um, well, this question is coming up with the schools we're working with every day, and has done. Obviously, it's the last day of term today. Um, you know, I'm being quite bold in 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 terms of what Life Feet stands for, which is that children, young people particularly teenage, but actually right through. I think primary schools are ready, readier and more able to, to commit to the first term being about community building, emotional, the processing of what's happened, the reconnecting, 
the kind of uh, in sort of linking that to curriculum that actually that 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 tension is not is not mm. so problematic. I think the secondary schools are really feeling the stress of this. Yeah. And they're even bringing in, how do we manage behavior? Yeah. So, and that really is, their question is, how do we meet the social needs and the, the sort of really the, the reparative needs around a level of trauma for all, for everyone that's been through this and is going through this, but at the same time, get everyone to behave in yeah. the way that we need them to behave in order to sit and learn and catch up. And so, and, and so my take on that would be that, particularly with teenagers who will have an acute need to, for that social, those social needs to be met, I would be prioritizing that certainly for the first few weeks, um, making that the priority, um, the rebuilding of the community, the processing the experience, the kind of reorientating in the spaces, connecting different groups, whether that's classes, tutor groups, in order that then the children, young people are ready to learn. Mm. Otherwise, I think they'll be trying to shoehorn that a group of young people into a process that kind of denies life experience. Yeah. It's huge what we've all been through. And so to actually deny that is, and then silo the odd young person into a counseling room to talk about I don't know, a bereavement or their anxiety just seems to me to be um, just unreasonable. And, um, and actually, I'm not sure it will work. I think there would be lots more behavior issues. Even young people that may seem to be compliantly getting on with things could internalize a lot of um, questions for themselves about, mm. could get very disorientated. Although, what we've also seen is that children and young people are hugely resilient. Yeah. And actually it's maybe the staff that actually um, through that processing with the young people, um, I've seen actually sometimes in some of the workshops we've been doing that the staff have, have need the space to process and connect because they have all the layers that they've been dealing with around their own families, their own challenges, like we've all been dealing with work, looking after relatives, all the additional challenges that, um, you know, school staff have. So in a way, if I were a school leader, I'd combine those two things and say we're going to commit to the first um, bit of that term being about processing and rebuilding as a community. And I would certainly prioritise that for the staff. And what would that look like practically? What kind of activities do you, would you be putting in place? Um, I would be sort of something we've been doing for staff in one county as I say in Sunset is we've been holding a regular um just a group for for staff to check in and to focus on their own well-being and their own self-nurture I would implement that if I were a school leader in my in every school I would say right we're going to have a staff session mm -hmm. that is reflective practice yeah. where uh the staff can actually talk about themselves Mm -hmm. uh, to the level that they feel comfortable but the focus on themselves what they've been through I've been doing sort of introducing some process to actually talk about what everyone's been through yeah. um, just reflective practice I might create an art process a creative process something like you know let's then work towards creating a poem together I mean, we did this on some of our online sessions with teachers you know in five minutes and there's something about the beauty that happens that is so healing. Yeah. When a group of people come together, create something beautiful that has a soul, soul in it, it's heard out loud, appreciated out loud. It might drop people a bit into a level of grief, mm. but it's so it would need to be structured in that holding. But there's something about it once it's done, it's done, because it's there. And then, okay, now we move on. Yeah. And does the something that people create together need to be beautiful to serve that purpose? Well, my idea of beauty isn't pretty. <laughs> um, I think there's very different things. I, well, by beauty, I mean something that it can, it can contain um, pain and anger and things that one wouldn't associate or even 
whatever, you know, um, sort of darkness of different kinds, that doesn't make something not beautiful somehow. I, I'm really talking about the kind of beauty of the, the soul, really, that, um, that recognizes life yeah. in it, the life itself. Yeah. So it's more about what's gone into it than the product, I guess. Um, it's, it's not a, we're not aiming for a perfectly constructed um, piece of art. That's not, that's, that's never what we're aiming for. Um, and, and that's always stated at the beginning of anything. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, teachers can find that a challenge, but mostly when we do these things, teachers say, oh, this would be really good in our classes because it liberates um, the children into doing away with that self-critic, particularly dyslexic students or actually anyone. It kind of it enables that creative voice and imagining and the imagination um, to, and I think they find that for themselves. Sometimes they start to self-censor themselves into the perfectly formed thing. Mm -hmm. But I've found that most teachers really, really dive into it and love it. So they can kind of create a sort of slightly bolder, braver way of learning maybe through that process, it sounds. Yes, and where they do away with the judge and the critic and the sort of evaluating principle of how perfect or beautiful is this. It's not, um, it's not, and we don't ever dissect the actual byproduct. And I see it as a byproduct, the performance, the poem, that piece of art. We don't, but we will reflect on it, but more in a, from the eye place of I feel this or I see this, not, we don't analyze, analyze things in that way. It's more of a holding of, it's held very lightly, you know? Yeah. So, um, yeah. I mean, it sounds probably a bit, um, I mean, I think the way to illuminate these things is to experience them really, because they're very structured, they're quite simple yeah. and they're very accessible, so. Yeah. What thought would you like to leave people with? What's your end note? Yeah, what would I like to leave people with? The schools, the teachers, the leaders, I would say, trust yourselves and your, many of you have that primary motivation of being um, a belief in and a commitment to, to the development and the potential of, all the pupils that and the and the young people you're around and the children and so trust that revisit that um come from that place collectively and individually and um be bold around that be bold because um we know that learning happens out of that place actually um and then i would say to everybody else you know creativity just giving ourselves time to nourish ourselves through kind of uncensored play or experiencing something creative in 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 its basic form it might be making a mandala outside out of leaves or it might be um you know writing a few words on a page just from your imagination it can really be self-soothing and it can really give give us a sense of hope joy connectivity the kind of wonder of life which is a great scaffold it scaffolds the challenge the challenging the challenges we need that in, in order to scaffold and also hold grief pain challenge worry um can build more trust i think in ourselves and life the lives we're living and each other yeah.